Hi there, and welcome to our second episode of Continence Chats. My name's Joe Bailey, and I work for Link Medical Systems. And the idea behind Continence Chats is very simply that uh, we're giving the opportunity to catheter users to share their story and experience of living with a catheter so that it can be a benefit to others who perhaps are considering having a suprapubic or a urethral catheter and uh, perhaps have questions about living with a catheter. Today I've got on the line Zoe McKenzie. Uh, Zoe is a physiotherapist and she provides physiotherapy services uh, for uh, patients and uh, individuals who have a mix of complex health needs. Zoe's going to be sharing her story with you today, so let's begin. Well, good afternoon, Zoe. It's nice to, nice to meet you virtually. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on Continence Chats. Um, tell us a bit about yourself. What do you do with your time? Where are you from? Um, um, yeah, so I'm called Zoe. I'm from Essex. I'm living in England at the moment. Um, I'm a physiotherapist and Pilates instructor. Um, I used to live and work out in Australia and then when I sort of got unwell and my bladder symptoms started, I moved back to the UK, um, but hoping to move out there again at some point when they open the borders after lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, I've now set up, I used to work in a studio, but now I've set up my own business called Active Autoimmune. Um, I spend my time helping others with chronic illnesses find a way to move their body that suits them and doesn't flare their symptoms. Um, so I work with people now all over the world, um, which has been great during lockdown because everything's virtual anyway. Um, so that's how I spend most of my time and it fits in really well with looking after my own health issues as well. Great, great. Um, we will link, if you're okay with that, um, Zoe, in the description to your, um, to your business. Yeah. Have you got a website out of interest? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, www.me.com okay. and Instagram and stuff. So yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so what was your journey to needing a catheter? How did that start? Um, and um, what kind of catheter do you have now? Maybe you can talk us through that process. Yeah. So it might take a while. Uh, so <laughs> I kind of had some, some elements of bladder issues kind of all my life, but mostly okay. Mm -hmm. I used to get kind of infections, but not full infections. Um, starting when I was very young to when I got older um, and it was really until um, I sort of forgot that I look back in my journal and I see all the time I'd write things like oh blood is playing up again we really need to go and get this looked at but never did um, but until I got super unwell um, which led to my diagnosis of lupus but I actually had surgery mm -hmm. um, and I think that's quite common with um, kind of my blood issue is that it often surgery is a factor um, so my other health conditions that link into my bladder problems I've got Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that's a connective tissue disorder um, that I've had my whole life that's a genetic um, issue it means that I haven't got enough collagen in my body so not only does it mean I'm kind of really flexible um, it also means that my organs don't really work so like my gut doesn't work um, and now my blood doesn't work so that's kind of part of it um, I then also have lupus which is an autoimmune disease and we think that was kind of quite a trigger because my body became really unwell with that I then also got repeat bladder infections until it just was like a chronic bladder infection mm -hmm. um, and then my bladder just went into retention. So it started with episodes of retention um, that then could kind of be managed, it would sort of pass. I'd often get an infection because I obviously wasn't able to go, so the urine was just sitting in there. Mm -hmm. um, and amount of times I was in a &E with like just insane pain. Um, and sometimes an even bladder scan me, like looking back, it was quite clear I was in acute retention, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't really understand what was going on or why, mm -hmm. um, or whether it was to do with lupus or EDS or both. So there was quite a lot of confusion initially. I was put under sort of the bladder pain syndrome umbrella that covers lots of things. Um, and now sort of, and then I had various tests, cystoscopies, um, each one of those went to complete retention. And that was my first experience with a catheter. So coming around from that, you're meant to be able to pee as normal, have a sandwich and go home. And I never was, could pee afterwards. So, um, and then they couldn't catheterize me either. So my first sort of uh, experience catheter was horrific. It involved about six nurses and doctors all trying to catheterize me when I was awake. I had, I think, that time I think I only had like one and a half liters of my bladder, but my bladder was like so full. Um, and they couldn't physically get a catheter in because it was so spasmed and there were blood clots blocking it as well. So mm -hmm. that was really traumatizing and not the best introduction to catheter life. Um, but as that recovered, I could survive without catheters again, but it kept sort of getting worse. 
then I had urodynamic testing that showed that I was in retention like nearly all the time and that's why I was getting infections so I started to self catheterize mm -hmm. um, before self catheterizing though I had had bladder insulations and they catheterize you for that um, and that one I remember being disappointed that it wasn't as traumatic as my first catheter but it still was quite quite painful and quite traumatic and that's because my urethra spasms so much so it's very hard to get a catheter in mm -hmm. and out mm -hmm. um, so when I was self-catheterizing, um, I first started and it was, it was okay. But as my retention got worse, as my bladder deteriorated, I was having to sort of catheterize up to sort of seven, eight times a day. Um, and then again, because of my issue, because it's my urethra spasming, when I would catheterize, it would spasm, clamp the catheter off. And even I couldn't then, mm -hmm. I still had a full bladder and nothing would come out. I kept going with that for way too long. I kept trying to make that work until I ended up in hospital again with think that what time was 1.7 liters in my bladder. Oh. Um, so full, <laughs> so painful. Then I had a urethral catheter put in. Um, so I'd catheterized myself about a year. So I'd done quite well. Oh. I then had urethral in for six months. Um, that at the time I was like, this is amazing. Cause I didn't have the trauma of self catheterizing. I wasn't up till 2am trying to self catheterize with a spasming mm -hmm. urethra. Um, but looking back now, I couldn't sit, I couldn't walk, I couldn't exercise. I was so, it was so painful all the time. Um, just where it was coming out was super uncomfortable. And again, logically, if your area of problem is your urethra and there's a catheter going through it, it's yeah. going to uh -huh. hurt. Uh -huh. Um, so I managed with that for quite a long time until that itself started to stop draining because it just was clamping around it. My urethra had clearly given up completely. Um, and then we had a few weeks wait while we got it all organized and I got my super pubic put in last July. So I've now had this for a year and this is definitely the best catheter I've had. Um, compared to the other two, I can just function so much more, live my life much more normally. Um, and obviously it makes sense because it's avoiding my area. My bladder actually fills and holds urine quite well and quite lucky in that sense. Mm -hmm. Although it's got scarring and some inflammation because of all its previous trauma, generally it's quite healthy. So I can survive with just a valve. Um, so it's much neater generally and it's just comfier. I can sit on my bum, which is only on reflection looking back. that I was like, whoa, how did I cope with the other two catheters? Mm -hmm. um, but you just survive, you just endure. And at the time, the idea of having a hole through my stomach was like terrifying and now it's like not a thing at all so it's just crazy what you learn to kind of adapt with and cope with when you run out of other options basically uh -huh. so that, uh, yeah makes sense <laughs> yeah indeed I mean did, did, were you particularly anxious when you uh heard what the procedure involved and the consultant explained it to you or how yeah you about that and I think I'd um they'd first mentioned it in January, so I sort of had it in my brain that they want me to have a super pubic at some point. But because the urethra at the time I thought was working fine, I didn't really think about it, didn't really research much about it. Occasionally I might put it into Google and see. I remember watching a video on YouTube of like an emergency super pubic catheter done, and it was very graphic and all a bit horrific because the guy was awake. And I was like, oh my goodness, I do not want that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> um, thought the idea of having something like on my stomach that I could see all the time um, I wouldn't really like but then I spoke to other people via social media who've had it and they said it had really helped them and they found it once it had settled like generally so much better than your refill catheter and then it's only really till it for me it became no longer just an option but like a necessary thing I had to do that I then was like just got my head around it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I had the best support leaving hospital mm -hmm. either before or after in terms of helping them helping you know like what to do with it how to look after it um that's the most I got was from speaking to other people so that's the biggest help I've had was getting tips and like knowing best products to use and all that kind of thing through other people mm -hmm. uh, otherwise just sort of leave hospital and you're like no idea what's going on <laughs> I think that that's an experience that's shared by a lot of catheter users is that they get the catheter and then it's kind of on your, on your own um, into the, into the wild with the super pubic catheter. Yeah. Um, and you don't really know what to expect. Um, again, I had really bad spasms from, it felt like I still had a urethral catheter in, which at first I thought it was because my urethra is so scarred from all the other catheters, mm -hmm. but that actually just has continued. It's 
still my, when my bladder spasms it makes my urethra spasm mm -hmm. but I didn't know at the time what that was if that was normal or anything like that so since again speaking to others it is kind of normal mm -hmm. but you don't know that until you know nurses and doctors don't really tell you about what to expect what is normal pain what's not normal pain and all that kind of side of things so um perhaps there's someone listening and they're and they're saying well I use I, I do self catheterization, but I know I'm going to need a super pubic catheter soon, or even a urethral catheter. What would a week in the life of Zoe look like with a super pubic catheter in terms of your routine with your catheter? Um, yeah, so my weeks depend. So I've actually just had a change okay. on uh, what day is it now? Yeah, a couple of days ago. So I'm still quite sore at the moment. Uh -huh. um, so I find changes quite painful. Not to put anyone off, but they just are for me mm -hmm. um but I'm finding different ways each time I have one I learn more and more what helps me so although I use a valve 90% of the time I'll free drain for the few days post change because I find that helps my bladder sort of settle again because it's not having to hold the urine so things like that it's all about picking up tricks and tips that work for you mm -hmm. um, and I've also been trialing different catheters um and I found that makes a massive difference to my recovery post change so some of the early, when I first had a catheter, I didn't even know you could try different brands or that there was different styles. Like I knew nothing at all. Um, so finding different ways, different straps, different ways to hold your catheter all helps. Um, and then once it settled down, depends what it's like, but normally two to three weeks take to settle down, mm -hmm. post the change. Um, it's pretty good. So then I just clean it twice a day as normal. So mm -hmm. I use Sarah water, cleaner it, restrap it. Um, I don't use any fixation device. I use like kinesiology tape just because I find it's the neatest way to hold it on. I use a tubey pad because I find that cushions it nicely but still lets it breathe. So I don't use any dressing or gauze or anything. I have these little tubey pads. Um, and I can exercise and move pretty well. The only thing I don't like still is lying on my stomach that much. Uh -huh. um, but I put a cushion on there that feels okay. Um, but otherwise, it's fine. Then I just use a night bag at night. Um, I've now perfected how far I can roll over onto one side without pulling it over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I still, most nights, go to shut my bedroom door and leave it standing there and have to go back and, yeah, <laughs> forget that I'm attached to something all the time. Um, and yeah, that's kind of my routine. And now I don't really think twice about it. Sure. Um, most days. My bladder pain is down to probably four out of ten during the day now whereas um before that it was much higher uh -huh. and if it's draining fine then i tend to stay infection free as well so that's good uh -huh. great what kind of challenges have you had with uh, with your catheter and um have you overcome them or how have you overcome them if you if you've had challenges um i think pain and the spasms the most uh -huh. um so and definitely around changes particularly um they found and i had like a change where it didn't come out mm -hmm. and i had to go to the hospital and then they left me on the list for like three days and then it fell out by itself and just right. like kind of trauma related to that mm -hmm. um so one like talking about it and talking to other people has really helped not feel alone with that kind of thing um because it is can be quite traumatic and having that level of pain as well can be quite hard to deal with all the time um, but then also problem solving so I've got a really good um, urology nurse who's amazing and really supportive and she's helped me kind of learn more about different catheters um, to which ones suit me so now I've learned that having like a 10 mil balloon in so the balloon that stays obviously in your bladder um, is probably too big for me because I'm quite small and we think that irritates my bladder more than having a five mil balloon in so now we only put five mil glycerin in the balloon yeah. versus ten and that's made a big difference in my bladder spasms so now post my changes I'm not getting that crazy few weeks of bladder spasms it kind of just goes up a bit but levels out much quicker whereas I was having like four weeks five weeks of bladder spasms and then I think as the balloon gradually shrunk as it often does um normally it got a lot easier so things like that just playing around with different and it could be the smallest change I think that's what I've learned the most is that sometimes it's the smallest change you do uh -huh. to your routine or piece mm -hmm. of equipment or mm -hmm. how you do things and that makes the biggest difference to sort of your comfort levels uh -huh. Great. so spoken to like uh -huh. scientists about catheters and <laughs> trying to understand how the different sort of styles are open tip and things like that make a difference uh -huh. Uh -huh. it's really interesting um you mentioned the importance of 
connecting with other CATA users and hearing other people's experiences. Um, how would you advise someone to do that? How, how do you get in contact with other people in the same situation? Was it through the hospital or was it social media or what was, how did you? Um, yeah, through social media. So obviously I've got my account at Be Autoimmune as a technique. It's like a medical account, but it's also because it's for my business, but it shares my story as well. Um, and I shared kind of my journey on my blog with catheters. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess because I'm quite open with mine, um, people reached out to me mm -hmm. um, but actually then I've got the most benefit from it as well because I've got in touch with them um, if you sit in a urology waiting room often um, being a young female you're one of the few young females in there mm -hmm. so I wouldn't say in hospital I ever really met anyone mm -hmm. um, but through online I've got a great group of friends who all kind of experience the same sort of things not all with the same type of bladder problems we're all a little bit different or different other conditions as well um, but yeah, just having that kind of understanding and mm -hmm. um, like speaking to someone before I got my super pubic, for example, was like so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I could have done it without her to kind of get through it. Mm -hmm. um, and also by then I'd already had my other urology nurse too, who also is really helpful to speak to. So just, yeah, that kind of what's it actually like, because there's not much online about living with a catheter. Mm -hmm. You've got the stuff online that's like, what a catheter is or like mm -hmm. oh it's a hole in your stomach but there's not the just day-to-day -day of mm -hmm. what it's like living with it can could I exercise could I still move because that was very important to me so um, it was useful to talk to other people about that mm -hmm. I think um, this I hear from um, a number of catheter users that when they first hear that they need a catheter or they first realize it dawns on them that they're having major continence problems um, Sometimes depression can set in. Um, mm. Sometimes, particularly for younger people, there's a sense in which you feel like your life is being robbed from you. Um, mm. How would you, what, what would you say to particularly younger people, um, being a younger person yourself, what, would, what advice would you give to a younger person who's beginning to experience continence problems and is, is concerned about that? And... Um, I think, well, how I sort of felt like it, I was grateful that I had so many years before that my bladder did work uh -huh. and accepting that it now doesn't mm -hmm. um just I don't know it wasn't like a sudden moment I just kind of accept it because you kind of have to I think what's amazing is we just endure what we need like what happens mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. and I when I first had to self-catheterize before that I was like I'll never be able to self-catheterize and then I did mm -hmm. and then I was like oh, never oh these the girls that have catheters all the time I could never do that mm -hmm. and then I did and so you actually it can often seem more overwhelming if you think ahead so far but when you just yeah. deal with it you end up dealing with it probably better than you think you will so sometimes thinking ahead is worse than mm -hmm. just living through it um and then I definitely do get days where I feel just so frustrated that my bladder doesn't work mm -hmm. um, and all the times I took it for granted before when it did um, and when I have those days, I just let myself feel miserable and a bit fed up. And mm -hmm. then normally it passes mm -hmm. um, with it again. So I think it's just, you're going to go through waves. And like, I've kind of been through another wave of like annoying with the change and with coronavirus going on mm -hmm. and like, Oh, I just wish I didn't have to have a cafeteria and it'd be so much easier if I didn't have it in, mm -hmm. but then it's passed again already. And now I'm back to being grateful that I've got my catheter and that mm -hmm. I can move again. And without it, I wouldn't be able to function. So mm -hmm. I think it's all about your mindset and you don't have to pretend to be positive all the time, but mm -hmm. then equally I'm grateful for my catheter now for what it lets me do. And I don't resent having it because without it, I would be way worse than I am now. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like a, an ongoing process and um, whatever stage you then get to, it's a new process. So looking ahead, whether I've got to do the Michinoff or you ask me in the, my future, I don't know at this stage, but um, all I can think of now is like, well, this is what I'm dealing with now and like, this is okay for now. So cool. um, kind of live as much in the moment as possible. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, you mentioned that you've, you've got a really good... Um, continence nurse who, who's, who's a help to you um what's been your experience of working with healthcare professionals um who've been caring for you um the good and the bad and would you have any advice for anyone on on uh on that aspect of having a, a catheter yeah so i've had um i'd say generally all the nurses i've worked with are lovely and amazing supportive um doctors i would say um are more mixed but also they 
they're not super helpful and not super knowledgeable about catheters. So when I've gone to them and said, my chain is really painful or mm -hmm. I'm struggling with my catheter, it's not settling down, you know, or I've got um, granulation tissue around my catheter sides, mm -hmm. they don't ever have any suggestions <laughs> of what to help. And I've had sort of appointments or phone calls with them and you come off feeling really hopeless and alone because you just feel like if they can't help me, who can? Um, but now I've kind of learned who to go to those questions with and that's mostly my urology nurse mm -hmm. um, both at the hospital and my community one mm -hmm. um, and they've got far more suggestions of how to kind of deal with those everyday mm -hmm. issues um, so yeah I think I, sometimes I'm like well I guess you can't expect a doctor to know everything and they don't live with a catheter or don't deal with them perhaps on a daily basis mm -hmm. so maybe that's why but then the other half of me is like well it doesn't take much to to learn or experience or kind of, you know, understand more about it of things that could help because things that I've learned have made a big difference to me. So if they could suggest that to other people, then, you know, and it feels like there's still a lack of research and understanding with um, bladders in general, but particularly like my kind of population, like younger females. Um, if you look at research towards us, it's very little. A lot of it is still male focused. Um, look at all the main urology foundation websites or um, charities about um, urine, urine problems and you don't really ever see things like Fowler syndrome or retention mm -hmm, issues mm -hmm, mentioned mm -hmm. so and then again there's not a huge amount about catheters um, again in my age group of the population so in those sort of resources and understanding you just don't see that much and like I said in waiting with before you don't see others like me you don't see leaflets mm -hmm. about retention and catheters it's very much around a different sort of group of people I think so yeah I've had mixed if people and I've like have gone to A&E and a doctor goes why do you have a catheter I find that quite frustrating because I don't think they'd ask someone who's older why they have a catheter but for me they're like oh you're too young for a catheter and I just find that kind of attitude frustrating mm -hmm. um, and having to explain my condition all the time like Fowler's or um, urinary dysfunction doesn't seem to be sorry urethral dysfunction doesn't seem to be super recognized or understood that much yet so that could be challenging mm -hmm. now your your job is helping to people helping people to take physical care of themselves when they have different conditions what um maybe this is too broad of a question but do you have any advice for catheter users in terms of how they should you know yeah so and take care of themselves so I've got a very much of a um, view on exercise should be a form of self-care um, and nothing should kind of put more, because I kind of feel like anyone with chronic health issues, and particularly catheters, we have so much to deal with already that I don't believe exercise should add to that. So I think of exercise as a positive addition to your life rather than something you should feel guilty for not doing or not doing enough of. So I come from that kind of view of it. Um, some days I can barely sit upright because my bladder spasms are bad and so I'm not going to force myself to exercise on those days but on the better days I do try and do things that feel good so walking for me sometimes can still be difficult depending on where I am on my catheter change or how it's feeling um, so I'll do more lying down or seated workouts things that generally don't move the area too much um, but then I can also have some days where I can sit on my static bike and cycle for 50 minutes mm -hmm. um, so very much listen to your body and be in tune with your body and just adapt things just because you see something on Instagram or someone everyone seems to be running in lockdown doesn't mean that's the only exercise form. There's plenty of other ways to exercise that could perhaps suit your body more. Mm -hmm. um, and generally with a super pubic, I found I can use my abdominal muscles the same. It doesn't hurt or anything like that. So um, there's no restrictions once your tube is settled. Um, so yeah, just finding what kind of works with you and working with your symptoms and pain and not pushing yourself too hard mm -hmm. physically or <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And is there anything else uh, that you'd like to share or any tips that you'd, that you'd, you want to, to share? Uh, so definitely I would say look at different types of catheters and different, yeah. even types of bags. When I first had my urethral catheter, I didn't even realize that I could request for different like length of bag i used to have the longest tube on top of it so it'd be like down by my ankle and things right, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> i realized i could get different lengths that suit me different straps uh -huh. um, 
I always like to secure my either urethra or um, super pubic secure it quite close to where it comes out mm -hmm. um, because I find the less it moves around the site, the less irritation you get either urethrally or super pubic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've already mentioned tubey pads, but they're great because you can get nice designs and they're comfortable. They give you that little bit of cushioning around your tube site. Um, and then obviously work, try and find a nurse that is understanding and supportive because like I said, for me, after dealing with doctors that didn't always get it, or I think even more so now with the going to be the overload of the NHS in catch up mode from coronavirus, um, you can feel quite alone with your catheter. So finding a nurse that's understanding that can help you, as well as finding some catheter friends, other people that are going through similar situations to you, um, really help you cope with that just sort of day to day burden of having to pee through a tube all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Zoe. That's been really helpful. I'm sure that lots of people watching will uh, have learned at least one thing or if not many more um, about living with a catheter. So I really appreciate your time. Well, I'm super open about it. I have no qualms about talking about pee at dinner anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time, Zoe. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay.